All right, guys, so TYT's Big Brain St. Uger went on Twitter last night to propose a truce, okay? A truce between the left and the right, between the populist on the left and the populist on the right to say, hey, listen, social issues are important, but let's put our differences aside for the sake of fighting the man on economic issues, right? We're getting screwed over, okay? That's what he's saying. And I thought these were some interesting thoughts from Sink. And uh, I'm going to read you guys his his thoughts, his proposal, which he's actually getting destroyed on, right? A lot of people are, um, you know, criticizing him for this. And I think there is some legitimate criticism here because a alliance between the left and the right, quite honestly, can never, ever, ever happen as long as you have people like Sink Uger who have a litmus test for whom they think it's acceptable to work with based off really silly stuff, okay? And I'm gonna show you guys what I mean, but before we get into that, let me read what Sink's proposal is, and then we're gonna go from there. Quote, social issues are really important and worth fighting over, but maybe the left and right wing should consider uniting on economic issues against corporate rule. We agree a lot more than people realize on some issues. Then we can go back to kicking each other's ass. Okay, so... Here's the thing, on the surface, I, I didn't think that this was necessarily a bad idea, right? Because I think there are people on the right who are realizing that, hey, you know, maybe these corporations, right, especially the ones that have gone woke, maybe the whole 100% free market capitalism, everything, maybe might not necessarily be such a good idea, right? Maybe that's not in our best interest. When they turn around and use the forces of the market against us, okay, maybe it's not such a good idea. Right. I think there's a lot of people that's starting to come to that conclusion. OK. And then also on top of that, you also have people that realize that, you know, hey, some of these corporations have sold us out to a certain extent. Right. Moving jobs overseas. OK. Destroying rural America. Right. Big corporations like Amazon, Walmart, the Bezos uh, of the world. Right. Th those people have really destroyed small business in rural America. OK. They, they really have. So I, I, I think that there is some agreement here on uh, identifying the problems. I think where the actual disagreements come is the solutions. And I also think that a lot of people on the right do agree with term limits, right? The fact that, hey, some of these guys should not be in Congress for so long, okay? They shouldn't be in Congress for 20, 30, 40 years at a time, okay? They should get in there, do their jobs, and then be done with public service. I think a lot of people on the right agree with that. I think a lot of people on the right probably agree with trying to get money out of politics, right? They agree that, hey, these corporations should not be able to buy off these politicians, right? They should not just be able to buy off politicians, okay, and then turn around and do the bidding of big corporations in order to screw over the American people, right? Corporations should not be able to buy the American government. I think those are some issues that the left and the right both agree on, and I think that Trump, right, as a right-wing populist, has kind of brought that to the forefront of the right wing movement, right? Has made conservatives realize like, hmm, maybe we're not as libertarian as we thought on the free market, right? I'm just saying. So as we read a little bit more about sync stocks, we're gonna realize why um, this will never work, right? Why we cannot come together on these very few specific issues here. He says, people on the left need to stop assuming that our side would immediately get duped by the right wing into voting for some racist fascist. Sure, be extremely cautious, but if we trick them into voting to raise their own wages or giving themselves free health care. All right, this is why I think we have some disagreements, okay? I, I think there's a lot of people on the right to say, I don't know about artificially raising the minimum wage, okay? We, I don't know about that, okay? About the effects that might cause. Right. A lot of people on the right also don't necessarily agree with free health care, even though I think a lot of people do agree that our health care system should be improved. And I think that the Republicans dropped the ball on that. Right. <laughs> Instead of trying to repeal and replace Obamacare, maybe they should have actually uh, worked on making it better. Right. Work on making it better. Maybe that's a radical idea. Right. That doesn't mean Bernie Sanders style free health care. Right. But there's definitely room for improvement in our health care system. OK, I think that's something that both sides can agree on. Then he says, I don't want anyone thinking I'm telling people to vote Republican. Their politicians are the worst people in the world and you don't hold hands with extremist groups and obviously fight them. But what if there are white wing voters who also hate corporate rule and corruption? So Sink is basically saying, hey, maybe we can fight corruption in, in the corporations. Maybe we can unite on that. But however, the problem with progressives, guys, 
is that they have these litmus tests in terms of whom they can choose to work with. And, and that makes them fail to realize that they actually do potentially have allies, mm -hmm. but they just refuse to work with those people for certain reasons having to do with racism or the perception of being a fascist or something stupid like that, right? And Sink exemplifies this where he talks about why he can't even work with Jimmy Dore, right? Because obviously it's like Sink, if you really want to come together with the right on certain issues, then you should be at the very least work with Jimmy Dore, right? He's on your side and you can't even work with Jimmy Dore. Why can't Sink and TYT work with Jimmy Dore? You know why? Because they've labeled Jimmy Dore as right wing because he's become more socially conservative on some issues, right? And there's some level of social conservatism that they just can't handle. They can't stand it, right? And because they can't stand it, they refuse to work with people who otherwise would be allies. So if you can't even work with Jimmy Dore, how the hell do you expect to work with a right-wing populist like C Tucker Carson, per se, right? Let's read here a Sink's tweet. He says, no, Jimmy starts by cheerleading for extremist groups like Boogalows. That's so dumb. Why are you doing propaganda for them? Then he goes to validate fascists like Tucker Carson and is a useful tool for them. Whereas I want conservative votes for proposals against corruption. Okay, so he goes out to Jimmy Dore for working with people that he sees as extremists on the right. And then he goes out to Tucker Carson implying that he can't even work with Tucker Carson. Well, what Sink fails to realize is that Tucker Carson is actually the biggest populist, most popular populist, on the right, because Tucker Carson has given monologues in which it sounds like there's some areas for agreement in regards to um, how the working class is getting screwed over by big corporations and corruption in politics. Take a look. One of the biggest lies our leaders tell us is that you can separate economics from everything else that matters. Economics is a topic for public debate. Family and faith and culture, meanwhile, those are personal matters. Both parties believe this. Members of our educated upper middle classes, now the backbone of the Democratic Party, usually describe themselves as fiscally responsible and socially moderate. In other words, functionally libertarian. They don't care how you live as long as the bills are paid and the markets function. Somehow they don't see a connection between people's personal lives and the health of our economy, or for that matter, the country's ability to pay its bills. As far as they're concerned, these are two totally separate categories. Social conservatives, meanwhile, come to the debate from the opposite perspective and yet reach a strikingly similar conclusion. The real problem, you'll hear them say, is that the American family is collapsing. Nothing can be fixed before we fix that. Yet like the libertarians they claim to oppose, many social conservatives also consider markets sacrosanct. The idea that families are being crushed by market forces never seems to occur to them. They refuse to consider it. Questioning markets feels like apostasy. Both sides in this miss the obvious point. Culture and, and economics are inseparably intertwined. Certain economic systems allow families to thrive. Thriving families make market economies possible. You cannot separate the two. It used to be possible to deny this, but it's not anymore. The evidence is now overwhelming. How do we know? Consider the inner cities. 30 years ago, conservatives looked at Detroit and Newark and many other places, and they were horrified by what they saw. Conventional families had all but disappeared in poor neighborhoods. The majority of children were born out of wedlock. Single mothers were the rule. Crime and drugs and disorder became universal. What caused this nightmare? Well, liberals didn't even want to acknowledge the question. They were benefiting from the disaster in the form of reliable votes. Conservatives, though, had an explanation for inner city dysfunction, and it made sense. Big government. Decades of badly designed social programs had driven fathers from the home and created what conservatives called a culture of poverty that trapped people in generational decline. Well, there was truth in this, but it wasn't the whole story. How do we know? Well, because virtually the same thing has happened decades later to an entirely different population. In many ways, rural America now looks a lot like Detroit. This is striking because rural Americans wouldn't seem to have very much in common with anyone from the inner city. The groups have different cultures, different traditions, different political beliefs. Usually they have different skin colors. Rural people are white conservatives, mostly. Yet the pathologies of modern rural America are familiar to anyone who visited downtown Baltimore in the 1980s. Stunning out of wedlock birth rates, high male unemployment, a terrifying drug epidemic. Two different worlds, similar outcomes. How did this happen? Well, you'd think our ruling class would be deeply interested in knowing the answer, but mostly they're not. They don't have to be interested. 
It's easier to import foreign labor to take the place of native-born Americans who are slipping behind. But Republicans now represent rural voters. They ought to be interested. And here's a big part of the answer. Male wages declined. Manufacturing, a male-dominated industry, all but disappeared over the course of a generation. All that remained in many places were the schools and the hospitals, and both of them are traditional employers of women. In many areas, women suddenly made more than men. Now, before you applaud that as a victory for feminism, consider some of the effects. Study after study has shown that when men make less than women, women generally don't want to marry them. Now, maybe they should want to marry them, but they don't. Over big populations, this causes a drop in marriage, a spike in out-of-woodlock births, and all the familiar disasters that inevitably follow. More drug and alcohol abuse, higher incarceration rates, fewer families formed in the next generation. This is not speculation. It's not propaganda from the evangelicals. It's social science. We know it's true. Rich people know it best of all. That's why they get married before they have kids. That model works. But increasingly, marriage is a luxury only the affluent in America can afford. And yet, and here's the bewildering and infuriating part, those very same affluent married people, the ones who make virtually all the decisions in our society, are doing pretty much nothing to help the people below them get and stay married. Rich people are happy to fight malaria in Congo, but working to raise men's wages in Dayton or Detroit, that's crazy. This is negligence on a massive scale. Both parties ignore the crisis in marriage. Our mindless cultural leaders act like it's still 1961. And the biggest problem American families face is that sexism is preventing millions of housewives from becoming investment bankers or Facebook executives. For our ruling class, more investment banking is almost always the answer. They teach us it's more virtuous to devote your life to some soulless corporation than it is to raise your own kids. Sheryl Sandberg of Facebook wrote an entire book about this. Sandberg explained that our first duty is to shareholders above our own children. No surprise there. Sandberg herself is one of America's biggest shareholders. Propaganda like this has made her rich. What's remarkable is how the rest of us responded to it. We didn't question why Sandberg was saying this. We didn't laugh in her face at the pure absurdity of it. Our corporate media celebrated Sheryl Sandberg as the leader of a liberation movement. Her book became a bestseller, Lean In, as if putting a corporation first is empowerment. It is not. It is bondage. And Republicans should say so. They should also speak out against the ugliest parts of our financial system. Not all commerce is good. Why is it defensible to loan people money they can't possibly repay or charge them interest that impoverishes them? Payday loan outlets in poor neighborhoods collect 400 percent annual interest. Are we OK with that? We should not be. Libertarians tell us that's how markets work, consenting adults making voluntary decisions about how to live their lives. OK, but it's also disgusting. I'm just saying. I'm just saying what Tucker Carlson said there sounds a lot like populist rhetoric on the left and the right. OK, that, that's what it sounds like. But see, Sink has already said in his mind, we can't work with that person because we don't like his views on social things. And that's why you can't take social issues out of it. This is why a left and right wing populist alliance will never, ever, ever work. Because the left has already said that we can't work with people that we think are racist, bigots, homophobes, uh, fascists, right? And if you label that, they don't care about whether or not you agree on some economic issues. Put it this way. You agree on the problems. You might not agree on the solutions, but they don't care about that, right? What they care about is, well, you're a bad person, so we don't want to work with you, right? Same thing they do with Josh Hawley. Because Josh Hawley is obviously a populist, okay? Josh Hawley has proposed uh, child tax credits uh, <laughs> larger than the child tax credits that um, Biden has proposed, proposed, right? Except Josh Hawley, his tax credit is designed to promote marriage, right? That's the way he tries to frame it, right? He tries to frame his economic policy to, pro to promote a desirable social outcome. And again, this was alluding to what Tucker Carlson was talking about in terms of how you cannot separate social issues from economic issues. They are both intertwined, Okay. And I think that that's the difference. The, the, the left sees social and economic uh, issues as two different things when um, they're really not two separate things. They're, they're intertwined. They will always be intertwined. They both function off one another, right? Another example, right? Like, again, they don't want to work with Josh Hawley, 
Okay, because Josh Hawley and what happened on January 6th, they think that he's an insurrectionist. So they're like, we don't work with insurrectionists. Even though Josh Hawley supported that, the child tax credit, right? Uh, Josh Hawley also supported raising the minimum wage uh, for publicly traded companies, right? Which is something that progressives honestly should be open to. But I've seen progressives on the left that have smeared Josh Hawley as a fake populist because he doesn't want to raise the minimum wage on small business owners, right? Across the country, right? Josh Hawley just wants to raise the uh, minimum wage on Walmart, but it doesn't go far enough for them. Okay. Also, Josh Hawley is a uh, trust buster, right? He's an anti-monopoly guy, which again, should be something that the left agrees with, right? They should be against big tech, but the left, we've seen them kind of embrace big tech uh, and censorship because they don't like what people on the right say. Right? They don't like right-wing voices on certain social issues. Again, you cannot separate the social issues and you can't take it out of it because the left, they have litmus tests based off of social issues. And I'm not saying that the right doesn't either. I think you know issues like abortion, uh, things like that, that <laughs> the right, I don't think, is, is given any ground on certain issues like that. Okay, But I think ultimately the right does see social issues, for example, like marriage, right, and institutional marriage and preserving an institution as marriage as foundational to an economically healthy society, right? Marriage can solve a lot of problems. We know this because the poverty rate for those who are married is a lot less, substantially less than those who are not, right? It's just, it is what it is. It's basic common sense. But at the same time, um, the, the right also doesn't necessarily believe that promoting feminism to the extreme is good for preserving the institution of marriage, which again, is foundational to a good and thriving economic system. Okay. Just like Tucker Carson outlined in regards to how, yes, all, all these women want to make so much money now, but that makes uh, men less desirable to them. Men who can't make as much money as they do, which again, breaks down the institution of the family, which is the key to the desirable economic outcomes that we want. So I just found this conversation to be interesting. I don't know if a left and right wing populist alliance is ever going to be possible, even though I think there's some issues that we we all kind of agree on here. Um, and and the, the main reason why is because you really can't separate the two in regards to social and economic issues. And the left they just have these litmus tests in regards to not want to work with people that they see as racist, sexist, homophobic bigots, right? That's why it will never happen. Sink can't even work with Jimmy Dore, right? You need to figure out what you got going on with Jimmy Dore, fix that relationship, and then come talk to people like Tuck, okay? But we know that will never happen. So let me know what you guys think. <laughs> Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Most importantly, share a black conservative perspective. Peace.